Welcome to the Westside Investors Network, WIN, your community of investing knowledge for growth. This is the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast for real estate professionals by real estate professionals. This show is focused on the next step in your career, investing. Thank you for listening. And please, if you like our content, rate us on your podcast provider. And now your hosts, AJ and Chris Shepard. Hi, this is Chris Shepard. Just a disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are for educational purposes only. They should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any shares or securities, make or consider any investments, or take any other actions. Thank you, and enjoy the show. In this episode, John Martinez will be joining us. He's the owner of Midwest Revenue Group and is best known for his sales training in the real estate investment industry. We will be talking about the sales process, the steps that he teaches his clients, and the negotiation techniques that lead to success. He also shares about the inside-out methodology that they use and how to uncover a seller's motivation and taking into consideration the influencers that may affect the overall sales process. So without further ado, welcome, John. All right. Today, we've got John Martinez with us from the REI Sales Academy. John, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah. So, you know, by trade, I'm a sales guy. I've been in sales for 20 plus years. Started out in in corporate America, really just building and and guiding sales teams. And uh, about seven years ago, I started my own sales training business. And a year into it, I got really pulled into the real estate investment industry. So today, we work exclusively with real estate investors and, and acquisition agents. It's really you know, it was a big part of my business and took over my business completely. So we're hyper focused on, you know, turning leads into deals, buying properties at discount. Awesome. You want to tell us a little bit like how you got into that industry and kind of like maybe yeah. where, where you started out in, in real estate or even in, in sales? Sure, sure. So I'll give you just the, the brief overview. So I started in all commission insurance sales when I was probably 19 or 20 years old just a lot of door knocking, cold calling. I worked five states and I just hit the road five days a week, you know, trying to sell insurance policies. Over the course of my career, I got into technology and technology infrastructure, managed services, and kind of worked my way up the, the corporate ladder until I was, I was building and running sales teams for some larger organizations. About seven years ago, like most investors that I work with, I kind of hit a point in my, my career where I just wasn't happy and I wanted to do something else. And I got that entrepreneurial bug. So I decided to do what my favorite thing was, and that was, that was just sales training. So I opened up a sales training business and really just did it locally. Tons of different businesses, tons of different industries. We ended up training salespeople in about four dozen industries. And about a year into it, I got called into a telemarketing company that produced leads for real estate investors. And I redid their scripting, trained their salespeople. And they had called this investor in Houston, Texas, that they called all the time. His name's Will. And Will said, I don't know what's changed there, but sign me up. I love it. And, and tell me what's going on. And they said, well, we're working with the sales trainer. And he said, can you connect me? And we got connected. And I ended up driving down to Houston. I knew nothing about real estate, the, the REI industry at all, besides the billboards you see, right? The we buy ugly houses type of stuff. That, that was my only exposure to it. So Will told me about the industry and said, can you train my team? And, and I did. And he, he had some success. Will is, was part of a couple higher level masterminds one of the the national masterminds where I think it's a minimum of a hundred deals a year to get in. And he started sharing what I did with his team, with the others. Before I knew it, I was working with 20 and 30 other investors. Then I spent about two years just traveling the country, working with with sales teams one-on-one in the REI space, just going out and and buying houses coast to coast, really. I'd buy a bunch and then I'd switch seats with either the investor or their their acquisitions team. And I'd, I'd watch them buy houses and give them tips. So Today, we train online mostly, and we do some, some, a couple of events a year where we train in mass. But that's really the whole evolution from starting slinging insurance policies to, to where I am today. So what, what made you choose sales? I, like, you know, I, I was starting out, coming out of college, I was very intimidated by having to do sales. So what, I mean, at 19, you just jumped right into it? Yeah, not exactly. I'm probably one of the biggest introverts you'll ever meet. I go to all these real estate events and I, you know, I'll go three days and spend thousands of dollars to be there. And then sometimes I won't even leave my room because that's just how 
introverted I am. So I'm, I'm not a natural salesperson by any stretch of the imagination. But the way it started was I delivered food for a catering company. I was the delivery guy. And the niche this catering company was in was in the medical field, pharmaceutical reps. The pharmaceutical reps would, would order lunch and, and breakfast for doctors. And I'd go drop it off. And when the doctor would come out to grab a bagel or something, the pharmaceutical rep would kind of corner them and, and sell their drug. So my exposure to sales was, hey, it's this, you work for minutes a day, you get free food. It was usually like ex-athletes. They were all, you know, just very attractive. They had the company cars. And so my exposure to, that's what I thought sales was. I was like, I got to get into this. So I put out a resume and an insurance company responded. And I had no idea that they would just hire anyone off the street because it's all commission. You get yourself licensed and you either make it or you fail. I thought, you know, they saw something in me and I was thinking, if they see something in me, I must be able to do this. Anyways, I took the leap. I, I quit my job. My boss tried to talk me out of it. She said, she said I was going to go broke and, and it was the worst decision I ever made. And I left that $8 an hour job. And fast forward a year later, I just hustled my butt off. I it still couldn't sell. I didn't know how to sell. But I worked really hard and I ended up getting my own insurance agency in St. Louis. And a year later, almost to the day, I went from eight bucks an hour to a quarter million a year. And, and at that point, I was hooked on sales. That's, that's quite the jump. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like the jump from, you know, hourly wage or salary to, you know, commission is, is kind of similar to the, you know, jump from being a property manager to, you know, investing in your own property, or it kind of takes a little similar mindset. So, you know, Absolutely. can you like, just like dig a little deeper into, you know, what actually, I mean, you saw the pharmaceutical sales reps and you're like, mm -hmm. this is cool, but like, do you have a little deeper level into what, you know, really made you quit your job and just go yeah. all in? Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm happy to share that. It's, it's probably a little embarrassing, but I'll, I'll share it all the same. So growing up, I had a chip on my shoulder. Number one, I had a speech problem. And until I hit about the sixth grade, no one could understand me except for my mother. So I learned to kind of hide and blend in. And then on top of that, I was really small. In high school, I tried to play football. I was the smallest guy ever on the team, 101 pounds. They had a special order, my equipment, my shoulder pads and my helmet. And obviously I got picked on and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, in addition to that, I was raised by a single mother of four kids, mortgaged the house multiple times. We didn't have any money. I, you know, one year I found out, I thought we were middle class until we got one of those Christmas baskets we made in school for the lower income families. I ended up with one on my porch. So I was just, I had this chip on my shoulder, right? I was a runt. I was picked on. I was embarrassed. And I think growing up through that, I just had something to prove. I knew I could make something of myself and I really just wanted to show people that I could do something with my life. So again, it's a little embarrassing, but the truth of the matter is, is I just had a big chip on my shoulder and I had something to prove. My motivation then is much different than my motivation today, but that's really what caused me to, to make that leap. Thank you. That's, you know, when you get like deep down to that, why it really, you know, it just really makes sense. So the first year that you were doing sales, it must have been pretty challenging. Like what are some kind of like the challenges that you, you had and that you maybe you maybe got? Through? Yeah, it, it was brutal. I mean, no doubt about it. I'd say my, I didn't start to learn how to sell until I was about a year into it. So it was just a hustle, hustle, hustle type of thing. So, I mean, challenges, it was just my, my typical week was wake up, cold call, which is not fun, all day long trying to get appointments in whatever state I was going to the next day. I'd go run those appointments. I'd knock on every door around those appointments. And then I'd sit in my car and I'd, I'd make more cold calls. I didn't have any money. So I had this 1988 RX-7 and it had no heater, no, no AC, no defrost. So I had a blanket. I'd sleep in truck stops in my car. I'd go five days a week on the road. So, and I hate talking to people. Obviously I do it for a living now, but back then I'd didn't know how to channel my energy and to do it properly. And I didn't know how to sell and just the rejection, the amount of rejection, 99 out of a hundred conversations were basically a slam door or hung up phone, a, a no. So I think the biggest challenge was just forcing myself to get out there and then dealing with the massive amounts of rejection. Once I started to make sales though, you know, my mind shift started to shift a little bit and I realized it was just part of it. And you start to get used to it over time. But 
yeah, it was, it was a massive challenge. Just I was completely out of my comfort zone 24 hours a day. It takes quite a bit to build. It's like you've got to build a thick skin. And you do. You know, when you don't have any experience, it's, it's quite a shock. Yeah. And that's similar to real estate investing when you're looking at deals. You know, 99 times out of 100, it's, it's a no, I shouldn't do this. And you can, you can lose patience. So what, you know, it, with that why that you had, that's, is that what kept you in it? You, you knew that you were like just as good and you were going to make something of yourself and you had that chip on your shoulder. Is that what kept you? Yeah. I, I wish I could say that's what kept me, but again, a little embarrassing, but I had to force myself. I had to just kind of burn the bridges, if you will. And I knew if I didn't do that, if I didn't force myself, I would give up and I, I'd quit. So I, I think the chip on my shoulder was my initial motivation to get in. But I, I know me and I knew when the going got tough, I was probably going to quit. So it really took just, just quitting my job, going down to that last dollar. And, and still in my business, I've got multiple businesses today. And that's how I run them is, is when I make a decision, I know it's going to get tough. And I know that there's going to be a lot pulling at me and I'm going to hit some tough times and I'm going to want to quit. So what I do is I, I, I cut off all the exits. And when I make a decision, I force myself to go all the way with it. Because I, I do know there will be those moments where things get really hairy and you just want to give up. And, and for me personally, I'm not strong enough. I don't have the willpower to just power through. So I have to cut off all the, the exit strategies for myself. Wow. As a That's large level of commitment. I mean, aggressive. I, I, we, we talked about it, but in another show, but there's, I think it's a, Ch- a Chinese fable or something, but they, they bring their ships and their army across the, the channel and they're, they're about to go to war. And then the, that night, the, the officer sets the ships on fire and says, there's, yeah. there's no other way but forward. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think you, you've either got that willpower and that determination built in, or if you don't, you kind of have to gain the system. You have to figure out how, how are you going to force yourself to push through. And I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why I think I love working with real estate investors is because they're all entrepreneurs. They've all burnt the ships, if you will, and just build something great. I mean, and today I work with, I'd say the vast majority of people I work with are, are small businesses, one to 10 people. But I work with some that are, you know, hedge funds that are buying in every state across the country and they started the exact same way. So I just, I love the mindset of everyone in real estate investment, the the kind of burn the ships mentality, the the high entrepreneurial type of people. It's just, I think that's why I do so well here. So kind of getting back into your like sales training, what, Mm -hmm. what, what are kind of the base tenets or the foundations of, of what, you are teaching your, your clients? Yeah. So, you know, the real estate investment space kind of had a lot of outdated sales strategies and techniques when I joined or when I got into it. It was just a lot of kind of hard closing activity-based selling where it's just, hey, we're going to talk to a lot of people. We're going to make a ton of offers. And we're just going to say, basically, do it, do it, do it, do it. In complex sales, you know, I, I studied about every sales system out there. And, you know, I've dedicated my life to this for 20 years. And I knew that that doesn't work in what's called a complex sale. I knew that you got to have the right conversation. You've got to uncover the compelling reasons, someone else, someone's reasons why they would take action. You can't sell them. And once you uncover their motivations and what drives them, then you need to turn the conversation to, well, what might stop them? You know, real estate investors I work with, they market all day long for motivated sellers, usually distressed sellers, but they don't always sell their houses because the next piece of it is what's going to hold them back. What are their concerns? You know, what are their fears? Who else is influencing the decision? So the next piece of our sales process is, is really what we call deal uncovering and eliminating deal killers. And after that, we do a quick presentation on what, they, what, what sellers care about right? Why they want to take action, you know, the, the distance between where they are and where they want to be, how we're going to help them bridge that gap, how we'd address all their concerns to the best of our ability, and then close the deal. So that's the, the, the simplified version. Set the stage for open, honest communication, dive into motivation, create an urgency to take action, uncover and eliminate deal killers, and close the deal. That, that's kind of our, our process. But just to back up a little bit, it's really a consultative sales, a real consultative sales process with some teeth versus the old school mentality of selling of just, 
call as many people as you can and close, close, close. The truth of the matter is, studies show that the more times you try to close a deal when we're talking complex sales, the less likely you are to get it. So you got to have a better way. So our philosophy is, is just to sell the right way, I guess, with, with consultative selling. Yeah, I like that. All right, so then you're, when you're talking about the sales process, you're talking about the process that's happened once kind of this lead or person is, mm-hmm. you're, you're already talking to them. Absolutely. I mean, so. we work with tons of people, even overseas, telemarketing companies, VAs that, that produce leads and we, we write scripts and, and all that kind of stuff. But the majority of what we do is lead conversion, right? Mm-hmm. When people get into real estate investment, the first thing they do is start looking for houses, start trying to produce leads. And once they get leads, you got to convert those things. If you don't convert those into deals, if you don't lock them under contract somehow, all the leads in the world are worthless. And, you know, as of really this last two or three years, I'm not sure if there's a single market out there where if someone's going after an off-market property, there's not at least one or two other investors going after the same property. So you really just need to, you know, learn to convert. So that, that's where we focus. Lead generation is great. We do some of that. But really converting a lead into a deal, if it's possible, is where we focus. Nice. So I'm assuming that you've drawn on, like, this, you know, your, your history and your sales experience. To, did you, are you, have you developed this system? Or is this something that you've compiled? Or kind of, you want to tell us a little bit yeah, more so, of how you, how you drew on your experience, I guess? Yeah, yeah. So a little everything. So, you know, I've been through, you know, in corporate America, there's, there's tons of different sales trainings that you're forced to go through. And, and then during your development, you, you start to get the itch and you want to learn more and do better. So you do a lot of self-study on your own. Really what I got into is past all the basic sales stuff and into what's called neuroeconomics. And it's just a fancy way of saying how people make decisions. It's taking psychology and, and you know, some of the other behavioral sciences and, and biology and economics and, and all, the, all the things that roll into how somebody makes a decision. And it's just a unified theory of decision making. So that's what I started to focus on. It was never really applied to sales. And we developed a, a sales system based on that and, and you know, other things I've read and, and things that are out there. And then got a copyrighted and, and put it out there. It was about a two-year process to really develop and refine our sales system. But it's all based in science. It all works. It's not, you know, a lot of sales training when I got started was kind of just hey, build rapport and be happy-go-lucky and keep trying to close and talk about the pictures on the wall. It didn't get me anywhere. So, you know, I focus on what actually works, what does, you know, what's backed by science, what's proven, and what, what's repeatable. What can we do over and over again and get the same results? So it's a very data-driven sales process. I know that sounds really nerdy when I describe it. It's a simple sales process, but it, every piece of it, every tactic, technique, strategy, is back backs up to, to science to provable repeatable facts i love that i love the kind of the science-based approach so aj and i we we've got a small brokerage team you know yep. it's us and five other guys and what we're doing maybe 25 or 30 deals a year how would you approach our team and how would you approach just like starting out yeah so it's kind of funny so we work with investors that are solopreneurs right investors that just are out there on their own doing every piece of their business all the way up to you know people doing a couple hundred deals a month it doesn't matter how big you are or what the exit strategy is it's the exact same sales process so when i start with companies that are you know the single investor or i think we just brought on one the other day that has 20 or 25 people on their sales team. They've been doing it forever. They've got a brokerage bolted on the back end to, to kind of offload those leads that, that don't close cash. It's the exact same sales process. And it's actually the exact same sales process we've used in every industry that we've trained in. Because at the end of the day, sales is sales. The way people make decisions or the way people make decisions, whether you're a big business or small business, it doesn't change how human beings think and make decisions. So funny enough, whether it's a small client, a large client, in or out of real estate investment, we teach the exact same thing. Okay. That's great. We know it works for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like, how would you get started? Like, what's the first step? Yeah. So, you know, whenever we train a new team and start with them, we really take a lot of time to define 
what's not working? What results are we getting that we just don't like? What do we experience on a sales call that that's not pleasant, that we don't like? Prospects who mislead or lie to you or just, you know, getting shut down or getting ghosted and, and all those types of things. And we start by making a list and then we go through exactly why each of those things happen. Once we realize all the things that we don't want to happen and exactly why they're happening, then we start to outline, okay, what does the perfect sales process look like? And what does that perfect sales process need to do? Well, we need to address all those things we just talked about, plus, you know, kind of mirror how, how people make decisions naturally. So the first thing we do is we just outline what's wrong and how do we fix it? And we roll out the sales process. And then we just take it piece by piece. There's really two pieces of, of, of the training. One of it's just the, kind of the, the process piece, step one, step two, step three, step four. And the other half is really, how do we get really good at those steps? How do we improve our communication so we can get through all those steps in the sales process with very little pushback, with ease, while fostering a lot of open, honest communication, no one hiding anything. So it's really just a lot of communication and soft skills on top of the, the, the process stuff. How do we get through the steps in the process quickly, effectively, and, and, and efficiently? So that's really how we roll out the sales training. We developed something called the inside out methodology. And, and what it is, is it's just a style of sales training that I have found to be extremely effective. I don't know how many salespeople you've worked with, but in my experience, in studies, Objective Management Group just did a study about salespeople and who's got the right DNA to sell. And somewhere around 93% of people in, in any sales force just aren't built to sell. They don't have it. They're, they don't have that, that DNA, right? It's not hard coded into them. So we realized we had to build a sales process that not only worked for the 7% that were naturally built to sell, but for the other 93% that weren't. So with the inside out methodology, we spent half of our training calls, maybe three fourths of our training calls, really getting people to realize why do, why do people you know, act like they do? Why won't they answer my questions? Why do they push back? You know, why do they resist? And all those questions. And, and with each training call, we spend about, like I said, three-fourths of the call or 45 minutes getting people to really understand the psychology and, and why people do what they do. And then once they adopt that and they understand it and they're 100% bought in, then what you say or what you ask or that, the actual sales part is really, really easy. But what we've learned is you can't just say, hey, say this, ask this. People have to understand and own why you need a sales process, why you need to ask and say the things you do. And once they do that, you know, the words are easy. You can take, you know, on average, our average client buys a house, whether it's on the phone or face to face in under an hour from initial converse or from, you know, the first piece of the sales call to contracting the house an hour to hour and 15 minutes. So we can actually script that entire sales call, what the acquisition agents we're training say. We have a scripted on one piece of paper. So the words are really, really easy. But if I just gave that one piece of paper to anybody, they'd gloss over it. They wouldn't know why they're supposed to say or ask those things, the importance of it, what happens when they don't, and it, it just, it'd be absolutely worthless. So our training is focused really heavily on why people do what they do, respond to salespeople the way they do, and get people to completely buy in and understand that. And then we give them some, some simple words or talk tracks or, or, or tools and, and then they're readily adopted. So the most successful sales teams we train now didn't come from real estate. They didn't even come from sales. They're just good people who can follow direction. That's who we see have, has, have the most success with, with our process is just people who can follow directions. Because at the end of the day, sales is like any other part of your organization. You know, the property management, right? You have a checklist when you get a new property. You have a checklist every month. You have a checklist when you're finding new tenants. Sales is the exact same way. It's a process. It's a checklist that needs to be repeated over and over again. So what we find is the best salespeople can follow a process and you give them the right process. Natural salespeople are kind of harder because they wing it. They don't like to follow a sales process. So we have high amounts of success with people who, that 93%. The 7%, we can give a process to and make better. Whether they follow it or not, that's always up in the air. Yeah. So... I'm kind of hearing that your guys' process is to really listen and understand and then apply, I guess, the script or the checklist or the process mm -hmm. to what you're learning from that conversation yeah. and really trying to understand 
in this case, it's the seller of a real estate investment pro or a piece of real estate. And then, you know, you, you then you've got all of these tools that allow, you know, maybe someone who doesn't have a ton of real estate experience, but they're, you know, they're smart and they can listen and they can figure out what the seller's problems are. And, and then they've yeah. got tools to help solve them. Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of trouble. I mean, it, if you have the more real estate and better industry knowledge you have, the harder it is for us to train. And the reason why is because those people like to share their knowledge, right? They like to, well, they just like to share everything they know because it gives them a sense of credibility, right? And it shows them, shows the, the prospect that you know what you're talking about. And if they don't have a process to follow, just getting into the nuts and bolts of real estate, it's super easy to fall back on. It's, it's harder to train those people because they want to talk about real estate. The best investors and acquisition agents, they don't care about real estate. What problem do you have? Or what are you trying to get towards? What's your motivation? And after I understand that and everything that might get in the way of you taking action, let me roll out exactly how I would help you get there the quickest and easiest way. Those are the conversations. Very little talk about real estate. That is so good. AJ? Yeah. Yeah. So when you're I don't know, kind of get into a little, maybe a little bit more in the specifics or maybe some examples, yeah. like when you're uncovering like these sellers motivations, like what are some common reasons that the, you find that sellers like what's, what is going to stop them or what are those like top ones that like that's going to stop sellers from selling? Yeah. So when it comes to, I mean, we, we call them deal killers or objections, but when it comes to those, those biggest concerns, the number one is, am I getting a good deal? Am I leaving money on the table? You know, you know, that's why people want to think about it. That's why people want to go get other offers. If they're talking to multiple investors, they go, I don't know if this is a good deal or not. So maybe if I get four or five offers, I can just pick the highest one and I'll know, okay, I'm not leaving money on the table. So leaving money on the table or getting taken advantage of or not getting the best deal possible is a huge, huge deal killer, even if they're extremely motivated and they want to do something about it. The next biggest one we see really comes down to risk and discomfort. The whole process, do I understand it? Is it going to be a pain in the butt? I've never seen anything like this before. I don't know how it works. It's scary. Can I trust this company? All those sources of risk and discomfort are probably number two. Number three, I'd say, is influencers. You know, most people, when we start to train them, they say, who's the decision maker? And the reality of the situation is when you're in, in buying houses or real estate, there usually is just one or two decision makers. But if you dig deep, you find that there's usually a whole other cast of characters who are influencing that decision somehow, right? Who really have a big pull, maybe even bigger pull than the decision makers. So finding out who else can influence the decision, not make the decision, not, not sign the piece of paper, but influence the decision, what's important to them and address those things as well. Probably number three. Number four, I'd say is other options. Can I keep the property? Can I list it with a traditional agency? Can I rent it, right? Can I rehab it myself? So those, I'd say those are probably the top four. Yeah. So how would you deal with, you know, somebody worried about whether they're getting a good deal? I mean, that kind of combines with other options too. Yeah. So yeah, what's, what's the secret sauce? Yeah. So the secret sauce is all in negotiation. The only thing a negotiation is meant to do is make someone feel like they're getting a good deal, squeezing all the juice out of, you know, whatever they're squeezing. That's what a negotiation is meant to do. Sales is all about making somebody want to take action. Or I wouldn't even say making, that's, that's the wrong word. Uncovering the reasons why they would take action, their compelling reasons. And when you do that, that you create this huge urgency to do something about whatever they're talking about and sharing with you and their, what their motivations are. That's sales. To wrap up the sale, they need to just feel like they're getting a good deal. So that's where negotiation comes in. We teach three or four different negotiation techniques that have been extremely effective at dealing with that last concern of, of, am I leaving money on the table? Is this the right amount? Should I keep shopping this around or, or whatever? The most common one is what's called price anchoring. It's resetting expectations. Whenever you're an investor, whatever type of property you're buying, chances are you are going to offer much less than what's in their head, right? than what they want or what they are yeah. expecting or your number is always lower. And by comparison, automatically people think that's a bad deal. So what price anchoring does is it's, it's a negotiation technique where you reset expectations, lowering them quite a bit. So then when you do make your initial offer, 
it actually seems better because they're comparing it to a lower number. Think of it this way. I remember when I was a kid, my mom took a shopping all over, like a TJ Maxx. And then there's this another store called like, I can't remember. It was like 50% off of 50% off. It was these discount stores, right? And when you'd look at the tag on the clothing, it'd say like compare it $300. And then it'd say mark down 50%, $150. And that was crossed out and said, our price is $29.99. When you look at that tag, <laughs> you're, you used to go, this is a smoking deal. So that's, that's, that's an example of price anchoring. Another way, another place you see price anchoring all the time is, is I'm married and my wife is a shopper and she comes home all the time and she never, ever, ever tells me how much she spent. She tells me, you can fill it in, how much she, she, saved. she saved, right? Because <laughs> she's been price anchored. Hey, John, this stuff's worth a thousand bucks. I got it for 400. I just saved 600 bucks. So price anchoring is a negotiation technique where we reset expectations. That's a huge one. Give and take concessions is another big one where if you never increase your offer or negotiate without getting something in return, it's, that needs to be a value for value exchange. Another great negotiating tactic that's extremely simple, but extremely effective as well, is always ending on a very odd number, right? If you go through and you're negotiating and you, know, you go from 100K to 125 and there's some give and take concessions and you reset expectations and you go back and forth, when you get close to your maximum allowable offer, we would usually offer something like $125,612.30. That's the final mental signal that this number came from somewhere. I'm squeezing every last freaking penny out of it. So these are just a few simple negotiation techniques, but they're really, really effective at squashing that. In, now that I want to do it, now that I want to take action, am I getting a good deal? Yeah, I can those really are, see. Those are, those are great techniques. Those are great techniques. I, I've used the ending on like an odd number with cents before. And it just, it says that like, we have done all of our research and everything. And like, this is the number like, and, that, and that's it. So, yeah. abs- because abs- what it, what it accomplishes is people go, this number came from somewhere. This is down to the freaking penny. No matter how much I ask, they're not going up anymore. And once they have that confidence that I'm getting everything I can out of it for many people, that's all they need to say. Now I'm ready to move forward. Okay. I mean, AJ loves the book, <laughs> Never Split the Never, Difference. Never Split yeah. the Difference. Yep. That's yeah. always a good, good negotiating book. It talks about setting anchors and, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Chris Voss's the, the book. Given, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty fun. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I think he's got a ton of great advice in there. The labeling and, and really effective too. There, there's a ton he teaches that's super effective. Yeah. Talking a little bit about influencers. I don't know that I've ever kind of delved into this idea that like there is that like one decision maker like they're going to be the ones kind of signing yeah. on the dotted line or maybe it's like you know a husband and wife or something but sure. i think when I, you're I, talking I, about influencers you're talking about like maybe other family members or friends yeah. or like grandma club members or something or absolutely absolutely so i'll give you some i'll give you some some real world examples my personal family but before the, before that though, i'll give you just high level example Oftentimes, landlords won't sell a property if they're worried about what happens to the tenants inside. The tenants have no, I, no, no pull whatsoever about if the property sells or not, but they are going to influence the decision, right? Even if they're never even talked to, they're a piece of the puzzle that has to be addressed. So let me give you a personal story to me. So I told you a little bit about my upbringing, my mom, single, single mother, four kids, that type of thing. So a few years back, all of us kids had grown up and moved out. She was still in the same house, much bigger than what she needed. She's over 70 years old now, and it was much bigger than what she needed. And she basically just lived in a very small portion of the house, and the rest of the house fell in disrepair. And she was embarrassed, and the house started to fall apart, and the repairs got more and more expensive. And for years, she wanted to sell. She wanted out of that freaking house, but she couldn't get out of it. And She calls me one day when uh, I think a water pipe burst in the front yard right after a water heater had broken and I had helped her with that. And I said, mom, it's time to sell. And she was the decision maker. But the people who made the decision were me and my brothers and my sister. She said, listen, you tell me what to do and I'll do it, but I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want anyone in the house because I'm embarrassed about the condition it's in. And all of our, the siblings, we all had, I was, I was a decision maker. Now, 
I ran with it. I was the ultimate person who's going to say, do this or don't, don't do that. But I was, I was nowhere on the deed. But, and my concerns were different than my siblings, right? My older brother lives in Phoenix. His big concern was my mom went to him for advice. And, and when I talked to my brother, because I wanted to get this thing done, I wanted my mom out of that house so she could enjoy her life. I talked to my brother and I said, you know, what's going on? What are your thoughts? And I dug into what he wants. What's his motivation? His motivation ended up being, John, I got my family down here in Phoenix. I don't want to get pulled into Missouri to go solve this. My wife's going to be very <laughs> upset. And we certainly don't want to have to throw a bunch of money at this to fix up the house or anything. So I said, Paul, okay, listen. So what you want, what your motivation is, don't involve me. As long as I don't involve you, you're going to sign off on whatever it is. And he said, yeah. I've got a younger sister who is very, very close with my mother. My younger sister had a child. My mom kind of helped her to single. My mom kind of helped her with the baby and everything. Very close relationships. And her concern was, I don't want mom to get taken advantage of. I don't want her to go through anything uncomfortable or, or again, get taken advantage of. So I talked to Sarah and I said, okay, so what I need to do is just make sure I handle everything from beginning to end. She's not bothered and make sure we get the best price possible. And if I do that, you're going to say, mom, go for it. She said, yeah, I've got a little brother. He struggles with mental illness, paranoid schizophrenic. He lived with my mother at that time. And he was a tremendous influencer because if something happened he didn't like, the whole world would come down. Very angry, damaged property, things of that nature, and, and paranoid delusion. So he was a huge influencer. He didn't know it. But if we rocked the boat too much and Jamie was uncomfortable with the move, moving into a new neighborhood, a new house, he was going to kill that deal. So I knew that I had to get Jamie on board with finding the condo we moved her into and get him excited about it. So just for my personal situation, what you pick up there is you've got one decision maker. And then you've got four influencers that all have their different motivations. Until I address all four of our motivations, the deal didn't get done. She lived in that house for years longer than she needed to because the influencers. So I, I hope that sheds a little bit of light on it. And when you dig oh into gosh. these deals. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, you went super deep on that. And, you know, like. But I mean, every seller is going to have something similar kind of, uh, among that. And it may not be as like as right. influenceable as like yes. those that you were talking about, but like they are going to have those things. And I can see like how uncovering who those people are and maybe an, and the seller may not even know what the influencers really right. ultimate goal is too. Yeah, and but you can, you, you know, it, it's actually much simpler and it's much, I'm sorry for, for cutting you off there. It's actually much simpler no, it's okay. than what people think. You know, instead of asking who's the decision maker, no one's going to list influencers. We like to ask questions like, hey, listen, if we get to the end of this thing and I make you an offer and you absolutely love it and we decide to move forward in some way, is there going to be anyone who might even be a little bit upset that you didn't run this by him first? And then you get to get them to start thinking about, well, yeah, I'm going to have to talk to my dad. He always helps me with these types of decisions. No way I can move forward without talking to him first. Then I'm going to find out, well, what's important to him and ask something like, well, how's that conversation going to go? What kind of questions is he going to ask? You know, what's he looking for? What, what does he want to see for you? And when I get to my presentation at the end, I'm not only going to address all of the person who's in front of me, all of their concerns and motivations. I'm going to address those of every influencer. If I want to close every closable deal as quickly and efficiently as possible, I've got to take all that stuff into account. And when I present, present to everyone's wants and needs so they feel either comfortable moving forward then or when they had that conversation with dad, I've coached them. They're equipped. Yeah, you know, here's how it works. I've already told them what to say. We've already discussed it. They can go into that conversation with confidence. And again, we're increasing our odds of closing that deal. Yeah, that's pretty deep into the sales process. I don't think that, you know, I've got like, you know, I've probably... I don't know, negotiated and closed 70 or 75 deals, but never really gotten to that point where it's like, okay, who, who's in, and I've always felt that, you know, in the negotiation, there's these outside forces that I have no idea what's going on. And it's like this invisible hand that is making everything so difficult. Yeah. And when you actually think about it, it's like, oh, well, that's obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's really what sales process is all about, is how do we just make sure we cover all the bases, check all the boxes, and uncover everything possible. The way I like to look at a good sales call 
is imagine this. Imagine you could read someone's mind, right? You could just, you see everything they're thinking and feeling. You wouldn't need a sales process. You wouldn't need to know anything about sales. You could go and talk to someone who had some real estate to sell. And as you're talking to them, you would know every one of those motivations and why they were important to them and how important they are. And you could talk directly to them. Hey, I know this is important to you. Here's how we'll help you get there. As you're talking, you could see exactly when they got uncomfortable and when to slow down and pull back and, and to nurse the conversation. You would know every time or everything they were concerned about. Hey, I really want to do this, but I don't know where I'm going to go, how I'm going to do this, how this will work. And you'd be able to address those things. If you could read someone's mind, you'd close every closable deal, whether you knew how to sell or not, because you just know what to talk about and what to address. So when we look at sales process, it's number one, how do we have this conversation that's so open and honest, it's like mind reading. And as we're doing it, what are all the conversations? What are all the pieces? What are all the things we need to talk about in terms of motivation and deal killers? Yeah, it's like mind reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, should we get into the last four questions? Yeah, this has been really good. Let's close it up. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm going to start it off. What's one piece of advice you would give to your 25-year-old self? Yeah, just do it. There are so many things <laughs> in my life that I just waited so freaking long to do. And then you do it and you go, why did I wait so long? I mean, I remember when I started my own business, the book that got me, that actually motivated me to take that leap was Richard Branson, Screw It, Just Do It. And it's a story after story about, hey, why not? Like, let's just do it. And, and that's, that's the exact book that motivated me to start my own business. So if I can go back to my 25-year-old self, all those ideas I had, all those things I wanted to do, just do it. Yeah, that's one of our like four tenets of real estate investing is, you know, continual learning, but also, you know, you can't live forever in the land of continual learning. You yeah. got to take the risk. You got to dive in. Even you if experience. you're going to make a mistake, you know. If you make that mistake, you're actually ahead because you've learned from it and now you're not going to do it again. That was a huge wake up call for me. You know, like I'm, I'm in a lot of these mastermind groups with the top real estate investors throughout the country, multifamily, single family, and everything in between. And I used to always look at them in awe and go, what makes these people special? And what I realized is when you look at two or 300 of them, they're not the smartest group. You got some really smart people, some that are, you know, on the other side of the spectrum. They don't have the most resources. The only thing I ever found that united all of these successful real estate investors is they just took action. Like that's the one and only in my mind thing that will lead to success is just taking action. It might take a while to get there, but like you said, you're either going to make some progress or you're going to learn along the way. And if you do that enough times, you're going to get pretty dang good at whatever you do. So I agree a thousand percent with what you said. Yeah, we actually... We actually had to do that with this podcast. I was a little hesitant to start <laughs> and AJ was like, I, you know, we don't have any systems. We're just going to do it. And like, we were talking with like, Oh, we need you to put headphones in. Otherwise we get reverb. And you know, we wouldn't know that now if we were still trying to figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Next question. So what was your first entrepreneurial endeavor growing up? Yeah, so I would say, I mean, growing up, I was in Boy Scouts and stuff like that. So you got all the typical childhood stuff. You got selling the popcorn door to door and then all the stuff, you know, school's always trying to earn money. So you're going door to door. There's just a lot of door to door stuff. That was probably pretty typical with, with most kids. I'd say my first real entrepreneurial endeavor was when I, later in life when I was probably early 30s or mid 20s, I'd say. And I tried to start a company selling telecom. I was in technology at the time. And I said, I'm going to start my own company selling telecom services, phone and internet services for kind of as a broker for AT&T and Windstream and all the major carriers out there. It failed horribly, but that was my first, I'd say, real, true entrepreneurial endeavor where it wasn't forced upon me. It was a decision. I knew there were risks involved. Uh, I failed miserably, but that was my, my first true one, I'd say. What did you learn? Yeah, I learned there's a lot more losing than winning. My whole vision of what success was, was people who just knew how to win all the time. What I've learned with that experience was it's a lot of losing, but if you keep losing, inevitably you get enough wins to keep kind of climbing up that ladder. And again, it's, it's not only taking action that we talked about a moment ago, it's not giving up. 
So it's not about losses. It's not about knowing how to win. It's, it's just really about keeping going. So, you know, when I was at, when I was in there, I probably bailed out too early. And what I learned again was those losses are normal. Like you're not going to just blow up right out of the gate. You're going to fail constantly, but you're going to squeak out a win every now and then. And, and over time, those wins become more frequent. And, and that's, that's how you build into success. So that was a big lesson from that, that experience. I really love yeah, that metaphor. We call, we call that like the entrepreneurial grit or the stubbornness. Like you're just so stubborn that you're not going not gonna to lose. And it's, it's going to turn it into a win sooner or later. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. How has your formal and informal training shaped your journey? I mean, 100% my entire journey. Everything I have that's good came from some type of education, whether it was formal, mostly informal for me, podcasts books. You know, I've had coaches throughout the years. I've been part of different groups. It's all been, I mean, it's a hundred percent of anything I can attribute my success to today. It's from education and learning. I remember, you know, early on in my business, I struggled with marketing and I spent more money than I ever thought I'd spend on coaching to go work one-on-one with, with Frank Kern in La Jolla, California. He's probably one of the best direct marketers in the world. And with that knowledge, we've been able to spring up tons of businesses successfully and market them profitably and, and, and so on. So from really big expenses to just YouTube videos and podcasts and everything in between, especially when it comes to, you know, not just the how to's, but the mindset you have to have, there's nothing in my eyes more important than education. Amazing. Okay. And our final question, we'll modify this a little bit because you're more of a business entrepreneur. What was your Moby Dick? the business opportunity or just anything that, you know, that got away, like the one you're like, oh, I just would have done that. Yeah. You know, I knew you were going to ask that question. And I looked at it before the interview this morning, actually. And I thought, and I thought, and I wanted a really good answer, but I, instead of giving you a really good answer, I'm going to give you the truth. For me, there's never been a Moby Dick. For me, it's kind of like, it's all singles and doubles. That's it. Base hits all the way down the line. I've never really had these massive opportunities. It's been consistency. Now, the opportunities kind of have grown a little bit over time, but I've never been the kind to chase these. Let me give you an example. I've built my business one customer at a time. My brother is the Moby Dick guy. My brother has a couple businesses where he's got investors for hundreds of millions of dollars. He's got a drink company he's trying to launch. None of them have gotten anywhere yet. I think he's going to really make it big someday. But he hasn't yet because he's only going after Moby Dick. I'm more of the, you know, just, just one fish at a time type of guy. So I don't think I've ever been in the position. I don't think I've ever gone after a Moby Dick. And I know that's not the answer you're looking for, but it, it's the honest one. You know, I don't think there is ever a right answer to these last four questions. It's, they're, they're all very, very unique. So really like that. Well, John, it's been a pleasure having you on. If our audience wants to get a hold of you or get in contact with you, do you have any suggestions on how they should do that? Yeah. Yeah. REISalesacademy.com is our website. YouTube channel by the same name. We've got hundreds and hundreds of free acquisitions training videos and and different things for, for real estate investors. Everything's free. Everything's out there in the open. You don't have to sign up for anything. So tons and tons of resources on the website and also on our YouTube channel. Amazing. Well, I loved our conversation today and you know, there's just a ton of good stuff in here. So I would suggest that everyone re-listen as we dive into those deal killers and uncover the seller's sure. motivations. Uncover those. Yeah. And the influencers. So Absolutely. John, again, thank you so much for coming on. I totally enjoyed the conversation. It was great. Thank you guys. It's my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast on WIN, your community for investing knowledge for growth. Please take a second to rate us so that we can get more great investors to interview. If you or someone you know wants to be on, please go to westsideinvestors.com and fill out our form.